Thank you. Thank you, Angela. All right, appreciate that. Uh, I just want to reiterate one thing. Next Sunday, June the 30th, is our Celebrate America, and you don't want to miss that service coming up, okay? We got some very, very special things planned next Sunday, and we want you to plan on being here and, and bring someone with you. Now, this is probably the, the least attendance we've had in probably six weeks, but that's okay. A lot of people called me, told me where they were, and a lot of sickness going around, but uh, they're just saving up something I'll come next Sunday. Amen. <laughs> but uh, I did want to reiterate that. And uh, and everybody, very, you need to really try to be a part of this special service tonight at 6. It's going to be awesome as God moves. Uh, one thing I want to mention uh, before we receive the offering, ushers, you can go ahead and get ready. We support uh, Here, I, Here Am I Ministries, which is to the Philippines, uh, Haiti, not the Philippines, to Haiti. And uh, we've got a newsletter here. And I'm not going to read it because it's quite long. But I'm going to place this out in the foyer. And I think it would do you well to read this. It, it kind of updates a lot of the projects that are going on. Uh, and also, uh, Dr. Uh, Doug Alford from <coughs> Fultondale area is now on the board of directors uh, since uh, he, I think he's retired from his physician practice. And he actually went to Haiti and uh, was able to work in the clinic that was there, and for those of you who are new to the church, and, and uh, this church has been supporting Here Am I Ministries almost since the inception of the church, and uh, there was a little old lady, little Sister Icy Mae Frederick, and uh, she was about, what, 80 years old, Mike? She was old, <laughs> but she used to come and, uh, and give us updates, and, and she, she was the in instrumental in getting that ministry going in Haiti, and she went when she, I, I mean, when she, she went, it was in her 50s before she even went for the first time. And uh, she was very instrumental in getting that going. And now there's a, there's a hospital. It's not complete. They're working on completing that hospital. There's a church. She mentored the pastor that is pastoring the church. Uh, they have about 600 in a, in a, a school uh, for children. And I was just reading one highlight I saw where they handed out 400 pairs of shoes to, to the kids. And uh, so... Read this letter. It'll, it'll help you see where your mission's money is going the first uh, of each month, and that would be a blessing. And if you, uh, as our ushers come, if you do want to give to our building fund, you say, I didn't know we had a building fund. Well, we, we, we have what we call a building fund. It's a savings account right now, but uh, uh, there's some things we want to do. And one, th one need that we have, and it's going to cost about $5,000, now, if you got that, you can go ahead and give it today. <laughs> but we need, we want to buy a portable building. And we want to, because as you know, we don't have Sunday school space, teaching space. And uh, it would be great if we could just raise that money and, and get it through donations and whatever. But, uh, and put out here, and th we want to get a 12 by 28, which can be, then put a divider in it. And it can be two classrooms. And then it can be opened up for children's church and have a large room for children's church. If you've never been back in our children's area, it's very, very cramped and very small uh, back there. And so we need to provide them some room. So that's a project that we're going to be uh, working toward here in the next, next few months, uh, hopefully sooner than that. But uh, that is something that you can begin praying about and if something that you might want to give toward. Randy, would you pray over the tithe and offering, please? Amen. You know, we are so blessed here at RCF with the talented musicians, singers, worship leaders, youth leaders, uh, you name it. We've got, uh, got some talented people, and it's, it's, it's a privilege to uh, have these young men in our church that can preach and uh, just do things. I can, I can ask Robbie, hey, Robbie or Matthew, hey, I need something back there with the PA system. And, man, they're Johnny on the spot. Ron, Robbie spent all afternoon here yesterday because we was waiting on a, a satellite guy to come, and I, we, we had a satellite put up for the Internet so that we could have Internet here at the church. And it's working beautifully now. So now we can, we, there's a lot of things we can do. And so, and then Paul, uh, you know, with the worship team and helping me out, I can call Paul and say, I need something, you can do something. And he says, okay, you know, they don't ever say, I don't have time. They don't ever complain, you know, and it's just awesome that we've got that. And Paul, uh, 
is going to preach this morning. I enjoy listening to these young men, and uh, I enjoy giving them the opportunity to minister. And so let's, let's just worship the Lord as Paul comes to minister this morning. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. I'm excited today because I feel like I have a word from the Lord for you. <clears throat> and I got a brand new Bible here that may not stay open to my page, but that's okay because I have we have internet now and we have a Bible slide, and so we have the slides on the thing. This is a, a waterproof Bible. They were actually went to a homeschool convention this weekend. We homeschool our kids, and um, they had these on sale up there. They had one opened up in a, in a thing of water and had water poured on it. And it's, it's designed for missionaries and for, for hunters and fishers to take their... Their logo is, Be Inspired Anywhere. So I thought that was pretty neat. So I'm preaching out of my waterproof Bible today. Um, if I had to entitle this message, it would be um, The Hope Within God's Minutemen. Okay, and so I want, uh, Matthew, would you pull up 1 Peter 3.15, that first slide there. And the scripture says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that you have not left us without a guide. Lord, you've given us the Word and you've given us your Holy Spirit. Father God, you have given us all the tools that we need to be successful as followers of yours. You've given us all the tools that we need, Father God, to take this world for your glory. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that as this message comes forth, God, that it would be your words, not my words. Father God, that you would make my tongue as the pen of a ready writer, Lord God, that you would... Lord, open the hearts of the hearers, Lord God, and I pray that the enemy would not be able to steal the word, Father. And we thank you for that, in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so, the Minutemen. Has anybody ever heard of the Minutemen? Oh yeah, the Minutemen. Back in colonial times, before America was America, before the USA was the USA, there were different countries that occupied this piece of dirt. And on this side of the country, it was mostly the French and the English. The French and the English have never liked each other, <laughs> ever. And so naturally, they were fighting each other for um, territory. So it became the practice in those days to raise up what they would call a colonial militia. So they had a, a uniformed army. And those were paid soldiers that were trained, whether they were British or French, trained, and that was their occupation. But then they had citizen soldiers called the militia. And the militia would be called on in times when the, the regular army needed reinforcements. They also would be called upon to, to um, defend their settlements. Okay? Because there was no police in those days. There was no, it was not, not a big deal for, a, you know, if you're living up in, uh, up in North Way up close to Canada up there, it was no, no, no big deal for a, an Iroquois uh, war party to come and lay waste to your village and steal all your food and take your women and, and leave you there dead. You know? So you had to learn to defend yourselves. So in the process of, of raising these colonial militias, they, they developed a group, a, spe a specifically selected, highly trained division of the, of the colonial militia that was designed for rapid deployment. That means people that you could call on at a moment's notice. They were required to transition from citizen to soldier in mere minutes after receiving orders, thus the name the Minutemen. Okay? They were always prepared to make a defense. Always prepared to make a defense. They were also among the first to volunteer to fight in the American Revolution. And because they were compelled to defend the hope of one nation under God, indivisibly, divisible, excuse me, with liberty and justice for all. They were compelled to defend their hope. Amen? So, now back to our scripture here. 
But in your hearts, honor, honor Christ as the Lord. Christ the Lord is holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is within you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect. Let me give you a little context here. Context means the who, the what, the when, the where, the why. What's going on at the time Peter's writing this? Context is a very important thing when you're studying the Scriptures. Okay, There have been many heinous things committed by people who were inspired by scriptures taken out of context. Amen? So, at this time, Peter is writing to the church. He said, it says in the beginning of 1 Peter that he's writing to the exiles. You know, the, the, at, in, in Acts chapter 7, the, Saul, who would later become Paul, began persecuting the church, and they fled from Jerusalem. Only the apostles remained. They fled all over the place to Asia Minor, to different countries, and, and actually began the first missionary outpush. But it, but it was spawned by persecution. So Peter is writing to the church in a time of great persecution. The culture was very hostile against Christianity. The Jewish culture, the Roman culture, the Greek culture, they all saw Christianity as a threat, and the government allowed those, those, those people to actually commit violence against the Christians. They had to really be in fear for their lives and their livelihood. So he's writing to the church in a time of great persecution, and the purpose is he's writing to them to encourage them to stand strong in the midst of a culture that is hostile to the gospel, and then he challenged the church to remember the hope that is found in Christ, and defend that hope, not with a rifle, not with a sword, but by sharing their hope. Amen? We're not called to defend Jesus with a sword or with a rifle. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. But my kingdom's not of this world. So we're not called to defend our hope with a sword or with a rifle, with a musket. We're called to defend our hope by sharing our hope. Amen? So, so here we go. So first of all, in order to understand this passage of Scripture fully, we have to first understand what is hope. That's one of those words that has become kind of amorphous in our modern culture. You know, we use words like joy. And we don't really, most of us don't really understand the original context. of What, the, what does that mean, biblically speaking? Or we use words like peace or words like hope. Well, I hope. So-and-so is going to be all right. Well, I hope this is going to happen. But, but to actually nail down what are you actually saying when you use that word. So I, I went to Mr. Webster, who, who incidentally was a man of God. He wrote the first dictionary. Amen. And Mr. Webster says you can either use it as a verb or a noun. And he gives several definitions. The first is to cherish a desire with anticipation. To cherish a desire with anticipation. Or to desire with expectation of obtainment. Okay? To desire with expectation of obtainment. Okay? Also, to expect with confidence. Okay? We go where I'm tracking here. You know, walking with me. And then if you use it as a noun, like this is my hope or that is my hope. Okay? It means desire accompanied by expectation or belief in. Also, it can be someone or something on which your hopes are founded. As in, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. <laughs> Amen? So, if we take all those definitions and we look at them in light of this passage of Scripture, we can boil them all to, down to say this. Hope is... The confident expectation of good things to come. Amen. Hope is the confident expectation of good things to come. I heard somebody say one time, and I fully agree with it, for the Christian, your best days are always ahead. Right. For the Christian, your best days are always ahead. Martin Luther, uh, the father of the, of the Protestant church, he wrote a hymn one time called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. You got to look it up sometime. There's a verse in there. Where he says, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. Amen. It doesn't matter physically speaking what anybody does to you, speaking in the context of the hostile culture that these Christians were engaging in, it doesn't matter if they hate you. 
It doesn't matter even if they stone you to death like we, we talked about Stephen in Sunday school class in the little kid Sunday school class this morning. We're here on a mission and we have a hope to defend. Okay, So hope is the confident expectation of good things to come. Now, what entitles Christians to have hope? Who do you think you are going around talking about all this hope? In a world where the economy is down, where people are losing jobs, where cancer and autism are, are more rapidly progressing than any other time in history, how dare you have hope? What entitles you people to think you have hope? Okay, well, actually there's a lot of reasons a Christian can have hope, but I'm going to focus on two, okay? Because, I mean, you can comb the scriptures and, I mean... The scripture says, uh, how precious are your thoughts about me, Lord. If I were to try and count them, it would take the rest of my life. You can't, you, they're innumerable, God's good thoughts towards you. Amen. Just, just absorb that. Innumerable. Okay. So, what entitles me as a Christian to have hope? You know, some people use hope as kind of a, they look toward the future with uncertainty and say, well... I hope these things are going to change. Or I hope, Lord, I hope they fix that economy. Or Lord, I hope they vote in a Republican next time. Or Lord, I hope, you know, whatever, or a Democrat, whatever your cup of tea is. Lord, I hope Honey Boo Boo wins American Idol this year. Whatever. <laughs> and people look to the future and they say, well, I hope so and so happens. But there's always this measure of doubt there. As Christians, we don't have to look to the future with uncertainty, with doubt, even though we don't know what the future holds. Billy Graham said one time, but I know who holds the future. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's look at a couple of scriptures here. Matthew, flip me to uh, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. And I, the first thing I want to talk about, the reason why you can have hope is actually something that happened in the past. Okay, got it? Next slide. Yeah, there it is. Sorry. Back up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You and I can have hope. We can confidently expect good things to come because Jesus died and rose again. Jesus died and rose again. Well, what does that mean? Why, you know, if you're here, maybe you're investigating Jesus. You're not sure about this whole Jesus thing. You haven't spent a whole lot of time in church. And you don't understand, why, does, why is it important that Jesus died and rose again? Well, I'll tell you. Okay? I'll tell you. Long, long time ago, mankind chose sin. Chose sin. Sin separates man from God. The, the scripture says the wages of sin is death. And the, the Paul Amplified translation says, and he pays on time every time. <laughs> the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. How did he give us life? Because you and I couldn't pay. I couldn't pay my sin. The only way I could pay is by spending eternity in hell. That's not a good deal. I don't like that payment plan. Have you ever had a bad payment plan on something? That's a bad payment plan. Okay? Well, the Lord said, you know what? These people can't, they can't do that. They can't make up the gap. They're underwater. They're done for. So I'm going to fix it. So Jesus came. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He taught the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, the, the religious leaders at the time hated him for it, and they nailed him to a tree. And he died vicariously. You know what that word means? Vicariously. He died in my place. He took on my sin, my shame, my addiction, my hang-up. He took it all on his shoulders. And it was nailed to the cross. They took him down off the cross and they laid him in a borrowed tomb. And three days later when he rose up, all that junk, he left it behind. Amen. And the scripture says that if you confess Jesus as Lord and you believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Amen. You shall be saved. Amen. Because with your heart you believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth you confess unto salvation. 
You confess Jesus is my Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That is why the Christian can have hope. If you have founded your faith upon the sure foundation of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, there is nothing in this life that can take that away from you. Nothing. My best days are always ahead of me because Jesus died for me. Jesus rose again for me. Me. And I know me. My wife knows me. I'm not a nice guy sometimes. <laughs> you know, we've all been down the road of sin one way or the other. Some of us went way on down the road. Some of us didn't go very far down the road. One sin is enough to separate you from God for all of eternity. Because God's that holy. He's that holy. He cannot abide unrighteousness. But He made a way. Amen? So today, if you believe in Jesus, and you know that He rose from the dead for your sins, you can have hope. Amen? Amen? So, number two. What's the number two thing that entitles Christians to have hope? Flip to my next slide there, please, sir. And this is 1 Thessalonians 4.13. This is the passage that we entitle, a lot, of, a lot of scholars have entitled, The Blessed Hope. The Blessed Hope. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may grieve as others who have no hope. Verse 14 says, Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus... God will bring him with those who have fallen asleep. He's coming back. Amen. Verse number 15 says, For we declare this to you, um, excuse me, we declare this to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, who, who, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Flip to the next one. Click. There we go. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of the command of the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God and, and the dead who are in Christ will rise first. You're going to get that glorified body. Amen. Then we who are alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, there's a word in the scriptures... That you, well, there's a word that we use in the church for this passage of Scripture. The word is rapture. Well, you won't find that word in the Bible, but that right there where it says in verse number 17, we'll be caught up together. That's a Greek word that may, it's called harpazo. And it literally means to snatch away as if by force. Shoo! To snatch away as if by force. It is the very same word that was used when Paul was nearly being trampled to death by the Jews and it said the, the soldiers had to take him away by force so that the, the crowd wouldn't crush him. Peter was, I mean, excuse me, Paul was preaching the gospel and the crowd rushed on him. The Jews rushed on him and they were crushing him to death and the Roman soldiers had to snatch him away. They had to harpazo him out of the middle of that crowd. Jesus is coming to harpazo you, to snatch you away out of this mess. So, if your faith is founded on Jesus Christ, and you know that he died and he rose again, he took care of your sins, then you can also have faith, because he put this in the same scripture, you can also have a confident expectation that he is coming again to reclaim you for himself. Amen. To reclaim you for himself. This passage actually is using, right there when it talks about uh, coming again, and Jesus said, Jesus said in one of the Gospels, He said, I go to prepare a place for you. John chapter 14. You know, all through the Scriptures, the Bible com compares the church and Christ, that relationship, to a marriage relationship. Well, when Jesus was talking about, I go to prepare a place for you, He was actually speaking in covenant language, marriage language. Because it was the, it was the, the custom of the day that the, when, when a man would come, he would come, he would see a girl, like that, man, that girl right there in that green shirt, she is beautiful. Look at them green eyes. And then I would go to my dad and I'd say, Dad, I've got to have her. She's got to be mine. And so he would go to Rick and he would say, my son 
is in love with your wife, with your daughter. Excuse me. Woo! That's a, that's a different denomination. <laughs> My son is in love with your daughter. And he asked Tavra, can we come to an arrangement? So they would come to an arrangement. And, and Dad would give him, you know, three goats or something. Yeah. Something like that, or a cow, or, you know, or they would come to some kind of an arrangement, and there would be a bride price paid. You know, Jesus paid for you with his very own blood. He paid for his, his bride with his very own blood. Okay? So then it would be the jo my job as, as, as the, the, the bridegroom to go back to my father's house and to build a wedding chamber, a place where I would bring my bride to to begin our marriage. And until my father said, it's good enough, I couldn't go get my bride. So I had to work on it, and I had to get it just right, and finally he would say, all right, go get your bride. And in the scriptures, it says that not even the son knows the day or the hour. But finally, when the father says, all right, son, go get your bride, and then, then what I would do after I get my permission from my father, I would sneak out in the middle of the night as a thief. Ever heard that before? And I would steal my bride away to the wedding chamber. And after we consummated our marriage, then there would be a feast for seven days. Has anybody ever heard of the marriage supper of the Lamb? There would be a feast... We would celebrate for seven days, and then she would be mine. Now, G the Lord, in his wisdom, installed that bit of history in the book as an example to us. Okay? As an example to us. It's something that we can latch on to in the past so that we can have hope in the future. Amen? Amen? God is so meticulous at doing that types and shadows and all these little things he puts in there that you really got to dig for where he's saying look here it comes here I'm, I'm coming I'm coming for you I'm, I'm, I'm coming I'm going to steal you away we're going to celebrate forever amen so if you're a Christian you can have hope in the death and resurrection of Jesus and you can have the blessed hope that he's coming again amen now number three Oh, yeah, let me say this real quick about Jesus' return. There's a, there's a term that we use, that theologians use, the, the return of Christ is imminent. That means there's nothing holding him back except the Father saying, go. It's sure. It's, there's nothing else that has to be fulfilled scripturally. It's time. You know. So that means he's coming soon. Amen? So then the question becomes, okay, we know... Where our hope is. We know what hope is, first of all. We know why we're entitled to have hope. Now, let's talk about defending that hope. How do we prepare? How, are we, how do we make ourselves prepared to defend the hope that we have? Well, the first thing is, people have to actually be able to see your hope. I can tell you I've got hope all day long, but if I, if I look like I was baptized in lemon juice, you're not going to trust what I have to say. Or if I'm mean or rude to you um or if i'm have you ever have you ever seen any any christians that reminded you of chicken little every time the littlest thing went oh the sky is falling oh it's all over with oh we're all gone oh my god it's, the sky is falling you know chicken little christians amen you know some little thing goes wrong oh the sky is falling oh we're all gonna die oh my god the devil's gonna get me oh that's not hope there's no hope in that okay no hope in that or you know, Christians who are anti-everything. You don't know what they're for because they're too busy telling you what they're against. <laughs> to the point that they sound like a bunch of haters, a bunch of bigots, you know. Oh, well, we don't like that. We don't like that. You better not look like this. You better not go here. You better not do that. You know, there was a missionary. Um, there was a, a, a story I was reading one time about a missionary that they had these people that had been going for years and years to this this Muslim tribe in, in Africa, North Africa. And they had been working and working, and what the people came down, when it came down to them asking the people, okay, what is the gospel? The natives I'm talking about. Well, you don't drink beer and you can only have one wife. That's what they thought the gospel was. You don't drink beer and you can only have one wife. And they were like, I don't want to do that. You know, because they had never been 
they had never been explained what Jesus gives you. It was all about what he was taking away from you. You can't do that, or you can't do this, or you can't do that. How about this? I don't want to sin because my Jesus means too much to me. And when I do, it breaks my heart, and I have to repent quickly because I want to be back in his presence. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts. It's about being in love with Jesus. Okay, so we have, to, we have to walk, we have to live, we have to, we have to be people who look like we have hope. Amen. If anybody's going to ever ask you about your hope, they've got to see it in you. They've got to hear it in you. Okay, all right? So, they've got to see our hope. Uh, Matthew, I didn't put this in there so you don't have to worry about trying to pull it up. Matthew 5, 13 uh, through 16 I'm going to turn there because I did not give that scripture to him. But that's okay. I've got a Bible right here. And it's waterproof. How about that? Don't laugh at me. Uh, Five. I haven't learned how to turn these pages quick yet because they're slick. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Pretty strong statement. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a lamp under a basket but on a stand that it gives light to the entire house. In the same way, verse number 16 says, in the same way let your light shine to others so that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen? Amen? People need to see our hope. Okay. Now, next, if we're going to defend this great hope that people can see in us, that's evident in us, if we're going to prepare a defense, and there, uh, in the King James it actually says to, to be prepared to give an answer. You know, there's different, you know, there's different, that's, it's all the same word there, but, but I like the word a defense. Because many times we are defending against, um, people come to us with, um, almost accusingly sometimes, well, how do you believe that garbage? Do you actually go to church every Sunday? Do you really believe that Jesus died on the cross? You know? And so sometimes people will approach you that way, and you have to know how to approach them. You have to be prepared to give a defense gently and with respect. We can't fly into a rage every time somebody questions your faith. Okay? Let me tell you something. This is a rule you can live by. If you have a point of view on something, and every time somebody attacks it, you get defensive, you're probably not very firm in your point of view. Okay. Yeah. If I have a, if my opinion, if I'm, if I'm feel that I must always go into defense mode, if I must always, you know, get ready to fight when somebody attacks my position on a, on an, an issue, it's because I'm not confident in my position. We as Christians can be confident in the gospel because, first and foremost. What does what what he say in Revelation? How do we overcome? By the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. Everybody in this room has a testimony. You know who you were before you were saved. A man with an argument, or excuse me, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. Never, okay? So, we have to learn how to approach these people. We also have to be armed with the correct weapons, with the correct tools to make a defense. So, uh, flip to Ephesians 6 there, Matthew. We're going to talk about the armor of God here for a minute. Finally then, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We do not wrestle, listen, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers over this present darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 
If you have an argument with a human being, you can rest assured there's a devil in there stirring it up. That's what the Bible says. You are not my enemy. Muslims are not our enemy. Allah is your enemy. He's the spiritual force in high places that's driving that machine. He's the operator. And people so many times get caught up and they become pawns to the enemy. We're not subject to that. Don't allow yourself to become subject to that. Okay? We can rise above that and understand what the root of this situation is. It's not whoever's, you know, this guy that his personality is like sandpaper. That's not, it's not, he's not my enemy. There's the enemy who is my enemy, okay? So, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand firm, stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Next slide. And, the sh- and for shoes on your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances taking up the shield of faith, which is able to extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication to the end... Uh, to, to Excuse me. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints. That's a mouthful. Now, there's a rule when you're studying Scripture called the, the law of first mention. And so, it, which basically means if something's mentioned first, well, then it's probably most important. So, the belt of truth is mentioned first, so I'm going to talk about it last. Because I feel like it's probably the most important thing. Now, so let's talk about the breastplate of righteousness. Does somebody shout out what righteousness means. Right standing with God. Now, righteousness is not something that you can earn or deserve. It is something that is imparted to you by the blood of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. When you place your faith in God, the Scripture says He made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ. So when the scripture says put on the breastplate of righteousness, what does the breastplate protect? Your heart, your vital organs. What you need to be able to do, and when I was a kid we used to pray in the mornings. Mom always prayed with us, and we would pray through the armor of God. You know, and that's awesome. But but let's dig a little deeper. Let's dig a little deeper than just reciting this prayer and thinking we've got the armor of God on. The breastplate of righteousness means you need to protect your heart by understanding your right standing with God. Okay? I'm standing in righteousness with God because of what Jesus did. Therefore, I need to flee from evil. Let me say this, and this might hurt your feelings, some of you. If your attitude is, how much can I get away with, you might not be saved. If your attitude is, how close to the line can I get before I'm sinning, you might not be saved. Because a person who is righteous, who understands the right standing that we have been given, given, we've been given that through the blood of Jesus, by the grace of God, that person will do all things necessary to protect their heart, to flee from evil, to flee from even the appearance of evil. Okay, So we need to flee from evil. That's one thing. When people approach you in the workplace, when they approach you at home, whether it's your family, whatever, we need to be people that eschew evil and love righteousness. That's who we need to be. Now, are you going to make it, make a mistake sometimes? Yeah. But you know what you need to do? You need to own it. Yep, I did that. You need to repent of it, and you need to keep walking. Okay, there are too many people that make a mistake. Well, I didn't do that. Oh, it was, I only did that because so-and-so did this. Uh-uh. If you mess up, own it. Yeah, I did that. Lord, I confess my sin to you. Repent of it and keep walking. But sin for the Christian should be the exception rather than the rule. Okay? So we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay? Now, shoes of peace. The readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Look, 
The scripture says, beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. Okay? What's going to carry you through this life? Okay? Your feet carry you through life. Uh, Bob Marley sang a song one time. He said, my feet is my only carriage. Okay? Your feet are carrying you through this life. And scripturally speaking, spiritually speaking, what Paul's talking about here is we need to walk in gospel of peace. We need to walk in, behave in, live our lives in the gospel of peace. You need to get in your word, in the scriptures, and you need to understand the gospel. You need to learn how to, you need to be able to share the gospel. That doesn't mean you have to be a preacher. That doesn't mean you have to be the most eloquent speaker. But you need to be ready to uh, explain the gospel to somebody that asks it. Okay? You need to be ready for that. Okay? Next, the shield of faith which is able to extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. Okay? This is simply, okay? Simply believe in what God says more than your circumstances. Okay? That's what faith is. Faith, look, let me set some of you free in here. Faith is not the absolute absence of doubt. You're always going to have a little doubt. You're always going to have questions. Okay? But faith is when, in the face of doubt, in the face of fear, in the face of uncertainty, I can step out and say, nope, God's word says this. In the face of financial situations, me and Ashley have, have, were in a place one time where we were, we were hurting. We were hurting. And we got to the place, I mean, I was depressed, she was depressed, we couldn't pay the bills. There was medical bills that had racked up because I was in a wreck and tore my foot all to pieces and didn't have insurance and had to have it all nailed back together. And, and I was sitting there looking at this stack of bills one day thinking, I can't do this. And this righteous indignation rose up in me and I ran, I got my Bible and I slimmed it down on the coffee table. I said, we're either going to believe what this book says or we're done. Now, what are we going to do? And she said, we're going to believe what this book says. And we did. We stood on that word. And it wasn't the next day. It wasn't even the next month. But God delivered us out of that situation. We made it through because of our faith. We took up the shield of faith and we extinguished those darts. Oh, you'll never be able to pay it. They're going to take you to jail. They're going to garnish your wages. They're going to do this. Oh, they're going to do that. They're going to take your kids away. You can't feed your kids. You can't take care of your wife. Da, 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 da. Nope. Block, 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 block. That's, that's the way we have to be. We have to understand. You need to, if you're dealing, let me give you this too. If you're dealing with a specific sin or a specific struggle, get in the Word and memorize some scriptures. Memorize some scriptures about that specific thing, and when that thing comes into your mind, immediately go to that. Boom. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. Be ready to shoot it up. The shield of faith. Amen? Now, the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. What does a helmet do? Protects your head. Protects your mind. The scripture says that our mind is renewed by the washing of the water of the word. Tell, can somebody tell me the three parts of salvation? Somebody that used to be in my class ought to be able to tell. We have a threefold salvation. We receive justification, sanctification, glorification. Justification means that you are free from the penalty of sin. Sanctification means that you are free from the power of sin. And glorification means that one day you will be free from the very presence of sin. Amen? So if that is what's surrounding your mind, you will be protected by all the voices that are out there. And there's a lot of voices out there saying, well, you know, maybe you ought to believe this. Well, maybe you ought to believe this. Well, maybe, you know, maybe this Jesus thing is just kind of more of a lifestyle than a, than a really a belief. You know, maybe Jesus was just a good teacher. Maybe this, maybe that, maybe this. Nope. Until your God, until your faith, until your philosophy can give me freedom from the, the penalty of sin, freedom from the power of sin, and freedom from the presence of sin, you got nothing to talk to me about. I don't want it. Because I've already got the best deal out there. There's nothing else that you can offer me. Another thing that a, that, a, that a helmet does is it would tell your opponent what army you're fighting for. 
Yeah, have you ever seen those Spartan helmets with the big crest? Look like a big chicken comb up there, a big rooster comb. People need to look at you and tell what team you're fighting for. Without you saying a word. St. Augustine said, preach always. Use words only when necessary. You know, people need to be able to tell when they look at you what team you're fighting for. Amen? Now, the sword of the Spirit. Everybody knows the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And in, in our armor, in our defenses here, it is the only offensive weapon. Everything else is to protect you from attack. The sword of the Spirit is your attack against the darkness in this world. Because there, everything that you need to lay waste to the enemy's encampments is right here in this book. Everything you need to raise his encampments to the ground, to shut him down, is right here. Amen? Sword of the Spirit. Now, we're going to go back and talk about the belt of truth. And you know why? And you talked about it when you prayed this morning. Who is the Spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And Jesus said when the Spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into all truth. Now, somebody tell me what a belt does. Holds everything together. When in the old time, they didn't wear pants like we do. They didn't wear, you know, they didn't wear, uh, you know, blue jeans and button-down t-shirts. They it basically had a, a piece of cloth with a hole cut in the top, and the belt served two purposes. It held your clothes, it held your armor together, and it held your weapons. Okay. The belt of truth is the spirit of truth. The scripture says you need to gird your loins with the, with the belt of truth, with the spirit of truth, because everything that we have here, every piece of armor, everything that God's given you is held together by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't effectively even understand your Bible, let alone use it without the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So we have to have his power and his authority girded around our loins to hold us together and so that we can be effective in our, in our defense of the hope that we have. Amen? Now, in conclusion, amen, during the American Revolution, citizen soldiers were called upon to defend the hope of freedom against a hostile regime. In the same way, believers in Christ... As believers in Christ, we are living in a world that is being held hostage by the forces of darkness. However, our King Jesus has dealt the enemy a fatal blow on the cross. And he has called on us, his minutemen, to go into all the world and liberate the captives with hope. Are you ready? Amen. Are you ready? Now, uh... We don't have to even put on any music, but I do want to say I, w I do want to do this. If you are in this place today and you are not, if you don't know that you know that Jesus is your Savior, I want you to come to the front because I want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. Okay? If you don't know that you know that Jesus is your Savior today, if you have questions about your faith, I want you to come up here and we're going to pray. Also. If there's anybody in the house that needs, if you're sick in body and you're here today, and we've already prayed for needs once, but if you're sick in body or if you're struggling with being able to defend your faith, if you're struggling, a lot of us struggle with um, feelings of inadequacy when it comes to sharing our faith. A lot of us struggle with, with, with fear and shame because, because, well, because of the culture around us and because of our own pride a lot of times. If you struggle with those things, I want to pray with you today. Okay? I want to pray with you today. So I'm just going to give you a few minutes to just think over that. And uh, where would Brett go? Maybe I was going to see if Brett could come play a few, some music. That's okay. We don't have to have any music. It's all good. Father, I just pray that you would seal these words into our hearts. Lord God, that as we... As we dwell in your presence, Lord God, as we seek you out and we seek to, to be your ambassadors in this earth, your minutemen, Lord God, the defenders of this hope. Father, I pray that you would quicken us with strength and quicken us with power, Lord God, and the Holy Ghost. Father, that those that are not filled with the Holy Spirit would be filled to overflowing God. That the gifts of the Holy Spirit would become to, begin to come forth in greater power, Father God. 
In fact, I speak that out. I prophesy that in Jesus' name that the gifts of the Spirit will begin to come forth in this congregation with greater power, with greater authority, with greater confidence. We'll begin to minister in the Spirit, begin to minister with the gifts of the Spirit, Lord. I pray that the fruit of the Spirit would blossom. Father God, that we would be a people consumed with love, Lord God, that we would love each other, that we would truly love the world, Lord God, God, because you first loved us and we love you, Lord. Father, I just worship you, Lord. I worship you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I thank you for this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Paul. I tell you, just to show you what we're up against, I heard this on the radio the other day, listening to a, I believe it was Bob Duco. There are now pastors that have formed a, a group, an organization called Pastors Who Are Atheist in this country. They're still past, they still pastor churches because it's their job. But when it gets down to what they believe, they don't even believe God exists. And they're coming out of the closet as atheists. Does God need some minute men? Does God need some minute men? Are you ready to defend the gospel against an atheistic pastor? That'll stand in a pulpit on Sunday morning and preach from the holy word of God and he doesn't even believe it? We live in some weird times, y'all. Strange, strange times. But we got a hope. We've got a hope. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Powerful message, Paul. Powerful message, brother. And I'm going to tell you, God, the results are in God's hands. And there's a lot of thinking going on in our minds. Because I can see your minds are turning. And, and just kind of digesting what Brother Paul has preached this morning. Very, very important. That you hold on to this word. And you proclaim it. Be ready to defend the gospel. Amen. Appreciate you being here this morning. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Don't forget our evening service this evening. The intensity, an evening of worship. It's going to be a powerful, powerful service. We'd love for you to come and be a part of it. Uh, let's bow our heads and be dismissed in prayer this uh, right now. Uh, Jack, would you dismiss us, please? <laughs>